A new decision on criminal justice was announced by the Supreme Court this week. The pieces of the puzzle are falling into place for adolescent criminals everywhere. I'm Rachel Kern, in for Gwen Eiffel this week. The Landscape, continued decision-making by the Supreme Court tonight on Washington Week. Covering every step is Brian Himmel, Senior Analyst for the Washington Post. Trevor Segebrook, Editor for Real Clear Politics. And Natalie Doherty, Senior Supreme Court Correspondent for The Atlantic. Award-winning reporting and analysis. Covering history as it happens. Live from our nation's capital. This is Washington Week with Gwen Eiffel. Good evening. This is the week it all became real. Major decisions were made by the Supreme Court in a pivotal juvenile criminal case. This case is known as Graham v. Florida, where, in a 6-3 decision, was decided in favor of Mr. Terrence Graham, the prosecutor, on May 17, 2010, just this past Tuesday. Mr. Himmel, why don't you give us a little history about this case and previous cases for our viewers? Well, Rachel, this case is pretty pivotal for juveniles in our criminal justice system. There have been quite a few previous cases that have discussed this topic, with the most important and relevant cases being Roper v. Simmons just a few years ago in 2005. The decisions made in that case made it illegal to give an adolescent the death penalty. The reasoning they used in Roper was based off of recent studies that had found that children under 18 were significantly less developed than adults and that children are susceptible to doing wrong things. What exactly did this case entail? Well, it started when Mr. Graham attempted to rob a restaurant in Florida at the age of 16, but he was caught and pleaded guilty to two charges put up against him, armed burglary with assault or battery, as well as attempted armed robbery. He got 12 months in jail and three years probation. However, within a few months, he committed another crime by sneaking into a house and holding an individual captive. He was again put on trial in the, criminal, in the adult criminal justice system, as opposed to the juvenile justice system, despite being still under the age of 18. I see. Now, he was found guilty of his crimes and given the maximum sentence of life in prison. That's correct, and since Florida had gotten rid of its parole system, that meant jail for life without parole. So that's why the Supreme Court was deciding in this case, a prison, without juvenile, a prison with for juvenile without parole who has committed a non-homicidal crime. This case was a Bill of Rights case because it was interpreting the meaning of the Eighth Amendment in the sense of what is considered cruel and unusual for an adolescent. That's correct, Rachel, and it's also a legislative case because it reviews the laws in Florida discussing the fact that they've gotten rid of their parole system for people who have received the sentence of life in prison. I see. Now, let's discuss the process it has taken to get to the Supreme Court. And why did this case come up now, Mr. Sagerbrook? Well, he had his first initial hearing and was sentenced to life without parole, and obviously he appealed it to the First District Court of Appeals of Florida. There, he again lost the case and they found the trial to be a fair trial and a just decision, so he appealed again to the Florida Supreme Court and was denied another trial. However, the U.S. Supreme Court agreed to hear his case, and here we are today. So why now? Well, with the decision in Roper, the cases have started saying, well, where do we draw the line at? Especially with all of the new research that comes out about the brain as it develops as adolescence. Well, let's discuss the arguments. Especially the prosecution's arguments. I know they had two specific ones. Ms. Doherty? The prosecution had a lot of sound evidence as to why the punishment of life without parole for a juvenile of a non-homicidal crime. Their first main argument was that it's cruel to not give a second chance to an adolescent for a non-homicidal crime. Also, their second argument was that since the adolescent brain has not been fully developed, it is cruel and unusual to give life in prison for a judgment they made as children. I see. Now, what are the defense's arguments? The defense also had two main arguments. The first was that the majority of people and states allow youth under the age of 18 to be sentenced for life without parole for non-homicidal crimes. The second was that the prisoners have rights in schooling and relationships, as well as health care, and that life in prison is not as hopeless as the prosecution made it out to be. And after these arguments, what was the decision of the justices? Well, the majority decision was delivered by Justice Kennedy, and he discussed the fact that the current standards of society are much higher than what they used to be. Justice Stevens, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor focused on chastising the dissenting opinion delivered by Thomas, Scalia, and Alito. Go ahead. And what was the dissenting opinion? They based their opinion off the fact that the majority of states currently allow life in prison for juveniles for non-homicidal crimes. 
This decision was in the best interest of the country, since it provides many adolescents with the opportunity to redeem themselves. Go. Thanks, Ms. Doherty. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. The conversation continues on Washington Week Webcast Extra, where we'll be discussing more Supreme Court decisions. That's later tonight and all weekend long at pbs.org slash Washington Week. Be sure to keep up with news developments each night on the PBS NewsHour, and we'll see you around the table next week at Washington Week. I'm Rachel Kern, and a happy summer to everyone. Good night.